Hello everybody, you're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a weekly album review from Twangling Jack Ford over in the Ilk Shed. We play some unsigned local and independent music. We head over to the Rylight Zone for a short story and or some poetry. And I think that's about it. Oh, and we have a different guest each week. I should mention the guest. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Arch Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. You can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at Wickham Sound. And I'm particularly here, uh, keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anyone with MP3s, news to share, or people who think that might be a good guest. And we're repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, and we're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So, this week we are going to be chatting to a poet. So we're going to be chatting to Lucy Constable, and we're going to get started by heading over to the Rylight Zone to hear Lucy give us a reading. Over to Lucy. It's the first time we met. You were a strange thing, dancing around, taunting me, drawing me in. Our first date went to pieces. You drained my blood, left nothing but a paper cut. To drown you out, I retreated, floating away in music. But one can only float a while to start sinking. On the ocean floor, I saw your hand, reaching, taking me to land. You were kind, you were gentle, you were my only friend. When I wanted to die, you were there. When I was stuck inside, you were there. When I was spilling my blood, only I always was. You are my blood. You run through me, you are my brain, irreversible, irreplaceable. All the skin, bones and limbs would be nothing without you within. The deep-seated suffering, the identity crises, the binary, the sex, the fury, the fantasy, the sweetness, the voice, the energy, you were there. And I hate you so much. I love you more than anything. That was Lucy Constable with some poetry. You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Seven Stars by Esther Hayes. Seven stars lost their light A burning sun knocked them out With all its blinding, raging might Unconscious of the damage inflicting Unaware of the impact of careless actions Careless actions The stars had to learn the sun wasn't only to blame The stars had to learn not to let the sun play this game Seven stars lost their light And with them left the night Left the sky blind Silly stars should have known, should have, should have seen it coming a mile from home. There's nothing new here, trouble always follows the sun and all it's becoming. To learn not to let the sun play this game You played a game Always leaving me burned I'm the one to blame For you I always yearn I screamed foul play You smiled and walked away For you 
these things never matter to you Matters of the heart And nothing but clutter Seven stars lost their light Why did they never falter? Why did they never falter? With undivided dedication Unaltered they hope for the sun to have changed For the situation to have grown The stars had to learn The sun wasn't only to blame The stars had to learn not to let The sun play this game The stars had to learn The sun wasn't only to blame the stars had to learn not to let, let the sun play this game You played a game, always leaving me burned I'm the one to blame Oh, you played a game, always leaving me burned I'm the one to blame For you, I always yearn
That was Alice Olive by Superlord, and before that we had Seven Stars by Esther Hayes. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm joined here in conversation by poet Lucy Constable. The first question is one I ask everybody, which is, what was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? Last book I read? Um, that was How to Be Famous by Caitlin Moran, and um, I basically fell in love with it. Uh, a massive amount. It describes the sort of difficulties of kind of growing up um, and also kind of discovering fame. Um, you know, you've got this character who she was, she was sort of in a working class family and then she moves over to London and she's building her career as a music journalist and um, she ends up in a lot of controversies and she meets some very interesting people. And it's just kind of the confidence that she carries on um, and the kind of influences around her, it really struck me because it's it's all about um, dealing with sort of um, discovering sex and stuff for the first time as well, uh, which was a very kind of rocky subject for me. Yeah. Um, so just relating to that was insane. <laughs> awesome. I yeah. mean, I've heard, I've heard of uh, good things about it as well. I haven't, I haven't read it myself, but um, it's because sometimes people come on the show and they'll come up with a book and I'll be like, I've not heard of the book, I've not heard of the author. <laughs> and so it's like, it's always nice when someone says like, or the best is when someone says one I've read and I'm like, yeah, we can nerd out about this book. Um, <laughs> but yeah, maybe I'll get to it at some point. I've heard the audio book's really good as well, because I think she reads it herself as well. So I oh, imagine right. I imagine that would help to like, yeah, to like, I guess, to really feel her personality coming across in it, you know? Definitely. And you can really feel that. Um, I've seen her speak uh, once before and she really you can feel that um sort of anger about you know sort of needing to be clean and uh I guess normal you know the idea that you've got to sort of be ladylike or yeah. you, you can't be messy um and you know and that's what I love so much about her is that she's like you know, well, I'm going to be me and I'm going to be messy. And yeah. if you don't like it, you know, I'm comfortable. So it's whatever. Yeah. <laughs> she really captures that. And I think it really helps with like young, young women growing up as well. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely like a role model for that. As you say, that kind of like just unashamed sort of take me as I am or, you know, it's, it's, yeah. an, it's not my fault if you don't like me kind of thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, exactly. I'm just being me. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So obviously today I want to talk to you about your poetry and I thought a good place to start would be, um, you know, what can you tell us about the poem that you sent me to be included on the show? Uh, that poem was about my relationship with poetry, okay. um, which has, it's always been so rocky because it's, I, 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 I've got a lot of sort of, I'm, I'm a very emotional person, mm -hmm. but I'm not good at understanding them myself and a way that I found um a, a way that really helped me understand what I was feeling and what I was going through was through poetry yeah but it made it very dark as well because sometimes if I'm feeling something so awful and I write it down it's like it confirms it yeah and so you know it's it really is that kind of love-hate relationship with poetry it's just like you know I I can't live without you you know I wish I could, but you just, you won't leave me alone. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I've got to learn to just, to love it, you know, um, and it has helped me through so, so many difficult times Yeah. and it, it makes you feel like you've got a true friend. Um, you know, at least, at least a notebook and a pen are there when you've got no one else to talk to. Yeah. Um, so that's really what the poem is all about was just my relationship with poetry itself. <laughs> Cool. And it, there's something there as well, because as you say, like the, the idea of like, once you write it down, it's like there in black and white. So it's almost, I don't know, it's kind of more real. And especially with something like emotions, which are quite like intangible and hard to grasp. So I can imagine like, I mean, I found the same with my own poetry. Like that's pretty, pretty similar to my own approach to poetry and writing in general, to be honest. It's kind of like, uh, like a catharsis. And actually, I was going to ask, like, would you do you see like poetry as a kind of is it almost like a form of like self therapy for you? It is and isn't, <laughs> um, because it does help me understand my feelings. I mean, I can't, with, without putting it into metaphors, I can't understand my thoughts. Yeah. Um, and it helps me concentrate as well. And it helps me work. Um, if there's anything that, I'm, that I need to write down, 
Um, and I, cause I, 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 I write sort of short stories every now and then. Mm -hmm. And if I, I, I just, I find myself just turning it into a poem. Like I can't help like rhyming it. It's just, and you know just making up all these weird metaphors because I you know that that's just it just helps me concentrate and then once I put it into the form of a poem I can make sense of it and so I can put it into then what becomes a story yeah um and <laughs> yeah so it's yeah it it definitely is kind of therapeutic and 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 uh, some, sometimes it stresses me out though yeah um and so it, it is and isn't. <laughs> yeah. but, and also what you were saying there, that makes me think of like, you know, it doesn't happen super often, but when like a poet writes a novel or something like that, like maybe like Sylvia Plath with um, The Bell Jar, for example, it's like yeah. you can actually, when you're reading it, you can almost tell like this has been written by a poet because the way they write prose, like it, it's, so, it's just sort of poetic in just the way they use language. And again, as you're saying, things like metaphors and similes and things like that as well. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to ask you about like, um, I guess like, so while well, my question specifically is like, how can poetry stay relevant in our modern world? Because I think a lot of people look at poetry as something, you know, something you're forced to learn at school and it's just like all William Wordsworth and, you know, um, all, all of that kind of stuff. So how, you know, how, how do you, how do you think that poetry can sort of stay relevant? Well, I think it, I think it already is relevant, but people don't realise. I mean, you look at music and rap that's poetry it's just poetry with a tune or with a beat or you know that that in itself is poetry um so i think if people realize that you know people kind of if people disconnected it from the kind of lack of a better phrase poncy versions of poetry yeah. you know um and people realize that rappers and um, songwriters, they are poets um, yeah. in themselves. And so I think if people realize that, they realize how important poetry is to modern culture and to modern music. Yeah. Um, it, gonna, yeah, they go, they go hand in hand, sorry. <laughs> that's, no, sorry, no, I, I was gonna say, um, uh, my friend Dave, who you met at the, at the open mic, um, he's, he says that poetry is uh, lyrics that people haven't found a tune for yet which yeah. I, again, I think it's, it kind of comes at it from the other angle, but I always say, especially, I think especially rap music, um, like it is just poetry. And actually you see like, I mean, a lot of like, cause I've nerd out on things like uh, battle rap and things like that. And a lot yeah. of the battle rappers are also spoken word poets and they either go, they go from one to the other as well. So some of them started out as spoken word poets and became battle rappers. And some did it the other way around and started out, you know, just proper like on the streets, you know, battle rapping in a park, and then before they know it, they're at a spoken word night or putting out a poetry collection or something. So there's yeah. definitely like some symbiosis there, I think. Yeah, definitely. And and poetry, even even without like the backing track, when you don't think of it as rap, even it still has to have rhythm to it. Yeah, it just does. <laughs> um, whether or not you think of it as a song, it still has to have a certain rhythm, or it just kind of is just a jumble of words. Yeah. Um, at least that's sort of what I found. I don't, I don't like my poems if they don't have any specific rhythm to them. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted to ask, like, because um, there's kind of rhyming poetry versus free verse. Do you have a particular favourite? Um, like, what are your thoughts on on the two of them? It's so annoying because I, I really want to write more free verse, but I, could, I <laughs> it doesn't feel right if it doesn't rhyme. Like, I always end up rhyming it anyway. Or like I'll rhyme sort of two lines and then I'll be like well now I've got to rhyme the entire yeah. rest of the poem and it's just like you know I, I want to be able to write more free verse um I absolutely love it and I it's it's an art form of it's a, it's an aspect of poetry that I'm still wrapping my head around because you see so many poets that that do perform with just free verse or they don't they don't sort of rhyme or structure their poems and it still comes out absolutely amazing you know and completely sort of rehearsed and passionate and it's just like how or you know yeah. um well I think it's like a, it's there's like a greater challenge to it as well because it kind of takes away in some ways like having a you know a rhyming pattern or even just trying to rhyme just generally it kind of gives you a bit of direction whereas if you're Otherwise, you're just a blank page with words. And I suppose all you've really got is like the rhythm of the words and things like that. You have to like rely on other things to, to take the place of the rhyming, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
So I wanted to ask you, we mentioned the Wickham Art Centre Open Mind, um, and you've read there, have you, was that the first time you've read there? Uh, that was the second time. Cool. And do you do you do other open mics as well? I used to. I I mean, the the Wickham Arts one was the first time I'd started doing it again after yeah. lockdown. Yeah. Lockdown really um, sent me away from poetry somehow. I just kind of disconnected from it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I used to go to an open mic night um, weekly in Oxford. It was called the Cat Weasel Club. It was absolutely amazing. Um, but then, of course, lockdown happened and everything stopped. Um, and yeah, without the sort of motivation to perform or without the sort of need to perform, I didn't have any need to prepare anything. So poetry yeah. just kind of drifted away. Um, so Wickham Arts was the first time in a long time um, that I'd been doing it. And I, I couldn't believe the buzz <laughs> when I got back up there. It was yeah. absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting one with poetry as well because like especially with open mic nights some of them are like really welcoming to poetry and then others either that it's just a flat out no or it is like just one poem between a couple of you know between everyone else is just up there with an acoustic guitar or whatever as well so yeah. I think it very much like depends on um depends on the venue I suppose um and also I noticed while you were there because you had your notebook with you um yeah. do you just carry a notebook around everywhere I try to if I can remember um but yeah, generally I will have a small notebook just in my bag. Um, it gets me into trouble sometimes because <laughs> uh, I get I get these thoughts and I'm just like just writing in the notebook when I'm supposed to be doing something else yeah. like working. <laughs> um, but yeah, generally I, I carry my notebook everywhere. Um, it's like a sort of safety thing. Cool. And um, what does like what does the writing process look like for you? I mean, I guess you've kind of hinted at it a bit there. It's sort of jotting things down as it comes to you yeah it's it's sometimes it's jotting things down sometimes it's sitting there and just trying to think of something just anything um and you know I, I don't know why but what frustrates me sometimes is if I'm like you know I'm trying to write something and they're like well why don't you just write about having writer's block and I was just I don't want to yeah. write about that um you know so it's sometimes it's like sometimes it's like I'm in a in a trance and I'm just like just scribbling these words down other times I'm just sat there just staring at a blank page and just, just I just have nothing and I'm just sat there getting so frustrated but generally it's a lot of energy and a lot of kind of confusion and static and frustration yeah um so it, it can be it, it can be quite dark especially given that I write a lot about my past experiences um, and so sometimes I have to really go there. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with poet Lucy Constable. And this is Clara with Where Is The Sky? And walked away How far is tomorrow And no day can stand being here Dancing on my own I wish I could fix it all To have those loves like we had before So don't walk on Say no words no more
you on the road tonight Well, we can fly, where is the sky? That was Where Is The Sky by Clara. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and we're joined now in conversation by poet Lucy Constable. I suppose that makes it more powerful in a way, especially when you're then reading it yourself. Because I mean, I always think this with like, um, you know, with, it's, it's kind of the same with music. Like if you're uh, a musician and you write a hit song, you know, you're going to be playing that night after night, singing it again and again and again. And you've got to like, you've got to really believe in it and, and actually have put part of yourself into that. Otherwise it's kind of, I don't know, it's gonna, it, comes, it comes across when you, you know, when you're not, <laughs> when you don't really believe in what you're saying, I suppose. So um, I suppose it kind of helps from, from that point of view because you're putting so much of yourself into it. It does. And I find that the more painful the writing process, the more enjoyable the actual performance is because yeah. it is, it's, it's like lifting a weight off, you know, it's like letting something go. Yeah. Um, and I, I suppose it's also as well it's like um it's kind of like proof that you've overcome you know, or you've come to terms with something like that especially again when you're writing about something painful from your past you know it says a lot just that you're able to write about it and it says even more that you're then able to kind of again to read that to a room full of strangers essentially it's kind of taking a bit of uh, a bit of power back I suppose it is absolutely um and it it sends a message as well um to, to, you know, to anyone sort of that would hear my poem or um, if anyone sort of has experienced the same things as me, it's, I, I feel that it's kind of important to get that message out. Um, I mean, the poem that I performed first time I went to the art center was kind of like, you know, if you get any of these um, situations in your life, this is what you do. Yeah. Um, and so I think knowing that I'm also, that I am spreading a message and I'm also kind of showing to the people that related to my past that uh, yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not gonna sit and say nothing about it. You know, yeah. I'm not just gonna be like, yeah, yeah, we were fine. It, you know, it wasn't fine. <laughs> yeah. um, and the more open a person is about what they've been through, the more open other people can be. Yeah. And that's actually true beyond poetry as well. I mean, that's why like even things like the Me Too movement and stuff, why it's just so important for yeah. people to make their voices heard, you know? Um, but I suppose poetry is like a particularly, I mean, with, again, with anything, it's like a particularly powerful way of getting a message across. It's like, I don't know, condensing it all into like, almost like a bullet or something like that, you know? It is, yeah. <laughs> cool. So I wanted to ask you, um, who are some of the other poets whose work you enjoy? And that, as as well as we kind of define poetry as including song lyrics and rap and, and whatnot, you can interpret that how, however you'd like to. Okay, so <laughs> in terms of in terms of spoken word poetry artists, my favorite I've got to say would be Neil Hilborn. Mm -hmm. um, his poetry is a lot about kind of mental health and and again like his past experiences and just the openness and the fury that he puts into it. I really felt that. And it's just, he has absolutely no shame in talking about how weird mental health can make a person behave, you know, and he's so kind of raw and angry and almost, it's almost kind of punk rock in the way, in a way, yeah. <laughs> in a very good way. Um, so he's definitely one of my top, top favorites. Um, but then if you go over to music, if you take it over to music, um, I'd say sort of people like uh, Youngblood, Major, <laughs> Major, sorry. That's all right. I thought that was me. <laughs> uh, major inspiration is Youngblood. Um, oh God, there's so many. Um, 
My Chemical Romance were a huge, a huge um, inspiration, especially when I was growing up. They got me into writing um, and they helped me understand about song structure and um, how powerful it can be to put your voice out there. Yeah. Um, and I guess another one, like this is gonna sound so hot, so freaking cheesy, but my dad, um, he is also he's a, a singer songwriter. Yeah. And yeah, I mean he's always he's always just had a knack, really. He's always just had an, this amazing way of just putting stuff together, and it always um, always works. And it. <laughs> Um, and it's just, it's also with the kind of the charisma that he puts into his singing and being on stage. Um, it's, it's really insane. Yeah. Um, yeah. And his poetry is frustratingly somewhat better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> He's had longer to practice though, so that's all right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. I mean, I suppose as well though, because you talk, you know, you talk about somebody like Youngblood, for example, like you don't see all of the struggles that go into creating a piece you just see like the final performance or the final song when it gets released whereas yeah. with, with your dad you know you can literally see him basically create something out of nothing and then polish it and perfect it and, and yeah. it kind of I suppose will help to then give you that you know that I don't know that belief and that confidence that it can be done you know it's not it's not magic it's it's just a process and it you know you just exactly. have to work at it yeah Cool. And you mentioned you uh, writing, you've like written some fiction as well. And I did want to ask about other formats. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, do you, would you consider like poetry to be your main thing or? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely poetry is my main thing. Um, and I have, I have a tendency to start stories and then never finish them. <laughs> yeah. But I've got a lot um, that I, you know, I would love to sort of publish it into like a collection uh but with that you need finished stories <laughs> so but and that's one of the things I like about poetry is that it it takes less to finish yeah um but it drains me more somehow yeah that makes <laughs> sense and also again everyone's like so time time poor these days I mean that's something I've thought about in poetry in the past is like even with short stories with, with the exception of maybe like flash fiction you know you're probably there for 20 minutes reading a short story in a novel you're there for what eight hours or whatever yeah. And a poetry, you can consume it in like two, three minutes. So it's kind of, I think, again, coming back to how poetry is like relevant in our modern world. Like, I think that should actually make it more relevant because we don't, a lot it of people should. just don't have time to, again, to commit to these longer form things. Um, yeah. and, and you mentioned, um, you know, the, the process of like bringing it all together. Um, have you planned to, um, or do you already have like any poetry collections in print? Not in print, I don't. Um, most of the poetry I have that's out to the public is um, on my blogger page, mm -hmm. um, which I haven't posted it on in years, to be honest. <laughs> um, so, but I'm I'm starting to kind of um, get back onto that because, uh, like you know, like I said, poetry distanced uh, from me during lockdown. Um, and so I'm kind of slowly going back up that ladder and, you know, I'm looking at all sort of my, my old poems on Blogger and I'm just like, wow, you know, that's so, so different from how I am now. Yeah. <laughs> so it would be great to sort of post more updated things about sort of who I am now and, and, and the, the person I've become. Yeah. And I mean, it's an interesting one, especially with poetry, because again, with you doing readings and things, it's kind of it can be hard it's very different like a poem on a page versus you reading the same poem at a, an open mic night you know so that can be a challenge as well because it's like well do I do you know again like do I carry on posting on blogger do I start soundcloud like how am I gonna how what is the best way to communicate the poetry you know yeah it, it's so interesting and I, I read so many of my poems and I'm like they're so they're so kind of hard to get through reading yeah but performing them is completely different it's a it it feels better to perform them yeah um I <laughs> and 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 that makes sense because like I mean I've I've heard sort of people say I've heard someone say to me before that my power was in my voice yeah and um and I really I really feel that and so the poems that I write they're written to be performed and not yeah. just to be read 
cool awesome okay and i'm um, just pretty much one last question to finish on and we've touched on it a little bit but and it's two questions in one so what have you got planned next and where can people follow you to find out more um so oh the best <laughs> best place to follow me would probably be tiktok um yeah. that's my most kind of that's my most active thing at the moment um so that will be at losky sky um and my next plan is to really just carry on writing um and really focus on getting things that are refined and and quick really yeah. um and in general finding a way to kind of put all of my sort of views on the world and and you know in, in terms of political and and my place in the world um to put that into tiktok videos and yeah really just writing and posting and writing and posting and hoping for the best <laughs> yeah. well and, and i was gonna say um you know with what you were saying about having your sort of the break for, away from it um, during lockdown and you you mentioned I think you specifically called it as like getting back on the ladder and it is kind of so you're kind of climbing that ladder and just seeing where it takes you like at the moment you have no idea but it's exactly. you know it's, and in part it's about the journey anyway right yeah absolutely I mean it's it's like I'm reunited with an old friend and yeah. I'm just, I'm getting to know them again you know I've changed they've changed it's weird <laughs> <laughs> Big thank you to poet Lucy Constable for joining me. You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Straight 8 with New Orleans.
take a breath You've lost yourself and lost your way Find your voice and you can find the words to say Talk about it Stand up tall Shout it out Shout it out again Slip away into this endless night and sleep Take my heart and take my soul They're yours to keep Be warm To a time when we have this forgotten nights again You're fine yourself so reason to begin and we'll fall away when all is said and done and you're the only one find the place disappear without a trace slip inside the person that you left behind then Follow your heart, tear it apart, make a new start You'll find your way, you're gonna find your way Slip away into this endless night and sleep Take my heart and take my soul, they're yours to keep Rewind to a time when we have this forgotten night To begin And we'll fall away When all is said and done And you're the only one And I'll take your hand Cause you can understand You can never plan When you lost yourself And you lost your way You're gonna find that voice And the words to say We won to a time when we had those forgotten nights again You'll find yourself a soul A reason to begin And we'll fall away When all is said and done And you're the only one That was Rewind by Serenade the Stars, and before that we had New Orleans by Stray 8. You're listening to The Arch on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to now head over to the Ilk Shed to catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's album review. The White Stripes. Elephant. The White Stripes were the antidote to digital recording. Meg and Jack would record on analogue equipment, playing with their own intuitive natural rhythm eschewing the tyranny of the click track's rigid tempo. Quiet and loud, soft and raw, keeping it real on reel to reel. If you were going to choose a White Stripes album, you would want the one that includes Seven Nation Army, one of the all-time great rock riffs. Jack White's decision to stick to the harsh tone of budget guitars gives everything a distinctive edge, whether bluesy, soul-y, country or punky. An example of this is their stripped-down version of Bacharach and David's I Just Don't Know What To Do With Myself. As an ex-husband and wife masquerading as a brother and sister, they had a familiarity with each other that allowed them to be intuitively flexible. If you watch clips of them playing live, you can see when they give each other the look. The flexibility that allowed them to cover all manner of style, from rocket-fueled dime store Led Zeppelin, to Nancy Sinatra and Lee Hazelwood type country. There is something very real about the White Stripes elephant. 
Big thank you to Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Lucy Constable for coming on and sharing her poems and being an excellent guest. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, and anybody else with MP3s to share, a story to share, or who might make a good guest. You can also listen to us on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, and we're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is a Reboot by Humans Can't Reboot. I'll chat to you next week. Sometimes all I can do is smile to move on with my life Hope that the tears in my eyes Try to pretend I'm okay inside Sometimes surviving is my daily fear And at night I forget how to feel Everything is working out Ever seem to be too weak All oh, broken beings can work again If I'm plugged for a few minutes or repair Humans have no reboot function We have to let go of the pain And say to ourselves I have what it takes to start again I repeat it every single time